Well, good morning and welcome to our online service today for the Trinity Sunday, uh, another big festival in the church's year where we think about the, the threefold um, Godhead of the church, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'll begin with some words of introduction and then we'll continue with some prayer, but much of the service today will be readings from scripture as well as some reflections offered by people from within our church. So let us be still. We are here today on Trinity Sunday, a day that perhaps captures the imagination less than any other in the Christian year and a point that is understandable. For rather than historical events, this date in the calendar is concerned with an abstract doctrine that has been perplexed amongst theologians and ordinary believers alike across the centuries. Of course, it is very complex, though the issues may be, we also need to think about them and reflect upon them and how this Trinity reflects the image of God. We try to pin that reality down as best as we can to talk about the experience in terms of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. But we are always at best simply grasping at the truth. For as the prophet Isaiah reminds us, God's ways are not our ways, neither are his thoughts our thoughts. We thank God for this day, the day that reminds us of this simple inescapable fact and we use it to deepen our faith enrich our experience of living and loving in his name and also his transforming presence. So let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we are here before you. Grant, grant us a glimpse of your awesome presence and help us to worship you with reverent praise. Father God, we are here before you. Grant, an, grant us a sense of your everlasting arms surrounding us and help us to trust always in your loving purpose. Lord Jesus Christ, we are here before you. Grant us grace to hear your call and help us to follow in your footsteps wherever that may lead. Holy Spirit, we are here before you. Grant us openness of heart, mind and spirit and help us to know your peace and power. Almighty and everlasting God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we are here before you. 
grant that we may know you better and help us to live and work for you this day and always. Amen. Well, our first reading today is taken from St John's Gospel, chapter 15. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would be not guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law, they hated me without reason. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. I didn't know what he was on about at the time, not the faintest idea. Despite the way I nodded and attempted to smile in the right places. The advocate, the son who comes from the father, what did it all mean? We believe that he was sent by God, yes, called to reveal his will, build his kingdom. But what, but what was he saying more? Pointing to a closer relationship. It seemed so, yet try as we might, we just couldn't get our heads around it. The Lord our God is one. Isn't that what we always been told? Indeed, he said it himself, made no bones about it. Or oh, how could he also tell us? He who has seen me has seen the Father. We were baffled. There's no other word for it. And when he went on to talk about the spirit of truth, the one his Father would send in his name, quite simply by then we were reeling unable to make head or tail of what he was getting at. Do we understand now, though, you ask? Well, no, we don't actually. Funnily enough, if we try to explain it, we will struggle as much as ever. The more we try, the worse the knots we tie ourselves in. Yet, strange though it may sound, it makes sense despite that. For day after day, year after year, we've tasted the truth, the, the reality of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We look up to the stars in under sky, the wonders of the heavens, and God is there, enthroned in splendour, sovereign over all. We look around at the world he's given, its awesome beauty, its endless interest, its bountiful provision, and he is there, stretching out his hand in love, inviting us to share in its wonder. 
we look nearby at family and friends, beyond to the nameless faces of the multitude. And he is there, giving and receiving, wanting to feed and to be fed. We look within at our aching souls, our pleading hearts, and he is there, breathing new live life, new purpose within us. One God, yes, but a God who met in different guises. We met in different guises, different ways. Three in one and one in three. It sounds odd, I know, and take it from me, you'll never explain it, no matter how you try. Yet don't worry, for what actually matters is this. For the words may fail you, the experience never will. We share some words now from St. Matthew's Gospel. Come into his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? 
Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of the lack of faith. Do you know what they're saying about him? You're not going to believe it. There are all kinds of rumours flying about that he's Moses, Elijah, or another of the prophets. But some are now actually claiming he's the Messiah, the one we've waited for all this time, God's promised deliverer. I said you wouldn't believe it, didn't I? Yet plenty do, apparently. A great multitude always around him, hanging on his every word, applauding his every action, following his every move with open adulation. And the worst of it is, he's done nothing to discourage them, no attempt whatsoever to cool their ardour a little or prompt a moment's reasoned reflection. I swear he's coming to believe what they're saying about him, allowing the hype and hysteria to go to his head. At least that's how it seems the other day when he strolled back here into Nazareth, entourage on tow, barely back five minutes, and there he was in the synagogue, interpreting the scriptures telling us how we should live our lives as though he was an expert or something, privy to some special relationship with God denied the rest of us. Well, he may have fooled others, but he didn't fool us. No chance of pulling the wool over our eyes. We watched him grow up, you see, followed his progress from when he was a bundle in his mother's arms, and we knew exactly who we were dealing with. Oh, he's always been a nice enough lad, but I'm not denying that. Never any kind of trouble, like some I've mentioned. But he was just an ordinary young man, Jesus the carpenter's son, back from the back streets of Nazareth, a local boy with, let's face it, dubious origins, to put it kindly. No, I wouldn't go into that. Hardly fair to stir up old dirt. But you get my drift, don't you? We knew all about this man the crowds were flocking to. And frankly, the idea of him being sent by God was laughable. The proof was in the pudding for what did he actually do here when it came down to it? Precious few of these signs and wonders everyone was raving about and quite frankly after all the hullabaloo we felt he was a bit of a letdown. It's strange though for no one else has said that not to my knowledge anyway. I hear fresh reports about him day after day and always it's the same story healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, even raising the dead. Funny he couldn't do it here. There must be an answer somewhere, mustn't there? Probably right under my nose. If only I could see it. But it's no good. We know the truth, don't we? We've seen it with our own eyes. So whatever else, the fault can't lie with us. It can't, can it? Our next reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and he said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and he shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. 
everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language Akaldama, that is, the field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time while the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken from us. For one of these must become witnesses with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, known also as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Well, yes, I think it possibly did. For a time, anyway. It was a rare honour, after all, the ultimate accolade. So undoubtedly there was a certain swagger in my step for those first few days. I'd hardly, I'd hardly have been human if there hadn't been. But it didn't last long, for I soon came to realise that if I had my role, others had theirs. Just as important, just as necessary to the work of the kingdom. But it was the question of us and them, the select few lording it over the many, who were part of a team each with our own gifts to contribute, our own strengths and our own weaknesses, each depending on the other, as Christ depended on us. We did try putting labels on people throughout the time. It's true, deacons, teachers, prophets, apostles, but it didn't work. For though the ministries were real enough, the spirit couldn't be tied down to them. Leaky pigeon hole for our convenience. He was working through all, irrespective of our boundaries. Now here, now there. Each day, new surprises forcing us to think again, new evidence of his power, compelling us to take stock and walk our horizons. It was true for me as much as anyone, perhaps more than most, for I had imagined that day when the lot fell on me, that I was someone special, my name destined to go down in history, alongside the greats. The truth was soon to dawn, but through Christ, times had changed. We were all special, every one of us, all called to share in his ministry, to continue his work. The priesthood of believers, a company of saints, the body of Christ. I wasn't to be a star after all, but it didn't matter. How could it, for as long, so long as Christ was proclaimed and his love made known? What counted then, as now, is that I did my bit, and that you do yours.
We listen to some words now from 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us, of, he has given us his spirit and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God that he has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother and sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Sentimental rubbish. That's what some will accuse me of. Another airy-fairy spiel about love. Whatever that's supposed to mean. And I can see their point. For we do use the word loosely, enough sometimes to cover a multitude of sins. Yet, I'm sorry, but when it comes to God, there's no other word that will do. For God is love. It's as simple, as straightforward, as uncomplicated as that, the one description that says it all. And if you lose that simple truth, then you lose everything. Not that you'd think it, mind you, to hear some people talk. The picture they paint is altogether different. A God of wrath, they say, of justice, righteousness, punishment, sometimes jealous, often forbidding, remote, holy, set apart. He is those, of course, or at least he can be when necessary, but never out of malice, only in love. He longs to bless, not punish, to give rather than to take away. His nature is always to have mercy, to show kindness, to fill our lives with good things. If you see him otherwise, as some vengeful ogre intent on destroying you, then you don't know him. For I tell you, God is love. All the law, all the commandments, all our faith summed up in that small but wonderful word. And though I can't put it into words, you will understand what I mean if you really do know him. <coughs> For his love will flow in you, through you and from you, touching every part of your life. No, we don't deserve such goodness, not for a moment. For we'll continue to fail him, our love always imperfect. But isn't that just the point? The thing that makes love so special. It does cover a multitude of sins, cleansing, renewing, restoring, forgiving, refusing to let come go what may. That is the God we serve, the sort of being he is. And if that isn't love, 
I don't know what is. Let us pray. Gracious God, there are some experiences which we cannot put into words however hard we try. Moments of joy, love, awe, hope, beauty and so many more. Yet though these may defy expression, they are no less real. On the contrary, they are often more real and special than any. So it is with our experience of you Together with your church across the ages, we strive to articulate our faith, to describe somehow everything that you mean to us, your awesome sovereignty, your unfailing care, your intimate closeness, your presence within. Yet the language we use seems hopelessly inadequate. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, three in one and one in three, it makes no sense according to human logic, yet we know it to be true, not in our minds, but in our hearts. And so we rejoice and acknowledge you as our God in joyful worship, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen.
So thank you so much for joining us today on Trinity Sunday. I hope that the reflections and the readings have helped you in your journey of faith. And today I pray that the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit will remain with you, with those you love and with those you pray for, today and always. Amen. Amen.